following is presented by CrewRoundTable.com Podcast Network. Did you hear about the study that showed a correlation between drinking diet pop and suffering stroke or dementia? The study showed a correlation between these two variables, not a causal link. Correlation and causation are incredibly important words guiding how human beings make sense of the world. This show is about statistics, not about diet pop. This show is about learning how to interpret a fourth-hand account of a scientific study, and it's about understanding the difference between correlation and causation. Do you know the difference? Hot takes are the bridge between new ideas and good ideas. This is Hot Takes with Gino. Welcome back, my friends, once again to the latest and greatest episode of Hot Takes with Gino, proudly presented by the Crew Roundtable Podcast Network. Please visit us on the web at crewroundtable.com, where you can subscribe to the feed that gets you the flagship show, Crew Roundtable, as well as Hot Takes with Gino. For today's show, we are going to be looking at primarily an article from the National Post entitled, People Who Drink Diet Soda Daily Are Almost Three Times More Likely to Develop Stroke and Dementia. We're going to also look at uh, one of my favorite websites, stats.stackexchange.com, when we start discussing statistics. And we will also be taking a trip over to the University of Australia. But let's get into the article first, and let's start discussing this uh, study that took place, which is the basis for our discussion here today on correlation and causation. So there is an American study published in April of 2017, spearheaded by a senior fellow of the Boston University School of Medicine and published in the journal Stroke. This study shows an association between drinking diet soda and both stroke and dementia. People drinking diet soda daily are almost three times as likely to develop stroke, Alzheimer's, and other forms of dementia as those who consume it weekly or less. The study kept track of close to 3,000 individuals age 45 and over, and this was done over a 10-year period. The results were adjusted for variables such as age, sex, caloric intake, diet quality, physical activity, and smoking. Now, that's quite a quite a handful there. Um, as a lover of sugar-free drinks, and I consume quite a few diet drinks and sugar-free drinks every week, uh, any, even including some of the energy drinks, uh, some of those big tall cans that you see at the 7-Eleven, uh, this article naturally piqued my interest. And the first reactions that someone may have to reading about this study and the results of this study would be to toss out all of the diet pop from your life. Uh, Ban it from schools. We don't want children drinking this stuff. Uh, It it just seems like complete doom and gloom. But before we take out our pitchforks and head out to the Coke factory, uh, we should take heed of the following proviso from the researchers. Now, So this is from them. uh, Quote, We need to be cautious in the interpretation of these results. These results do not prove cause and effect. When you see these kinds of associations, you want to always ask what is the biological plausibility? What is the mechanism that might be causing this? What is behind the correlation of results observed in the study? End quote. Let's define our terms a little bit here. This is, this is the meat of the episode here. What is causation and what is correlation? Now, these are terms based in statistics and logic. They are technical terms to help us human beings make sense of the world through empirical research. What's empirical research? Empirical research means that we use the scientific method to test our ideas of the world. We go out, we look around, we make predictions, we observe, we test, and we evaluate. Things are ordered into some sort of relation with other things. 
the link between two variables is what we mean by having a relation, whether it's causal or it's correlated, between instances of the variables we observe. Uh, let's blatantly steal from the University of Australia's website for this example. Between the two variables of hours worked and income earned, there is a relationship between the two if a change in hours worked is associated with a change in income earned. And that relationship can come in two main flavors. Now, this is something everyone should be familiar with. Those relationships can either be one of correlation, which is a statistical measure expressed as a number that describes the size and direction of a relationship between two or more variables. A correlation between variables, however, does not automatically mean that the change in one variable is the cause of the change in the values of the other variable. Very important. All that does, all a correlation does, is show that there is a relation where two things occur simultaneously. It doesn't say if one causes the other, it doesn't say if one occurs after the other, it doesn't say how they occur in relation to each other, just that they're both present at some time. This is very different from causation. Causation indicates that one event is the result of the occurrence of the other event. It's an if-then relationship that must hold, i.e., that is to say, there is a causal relationship between the two events. If one item is observed, then the second must follow. A causal relationship is therefore much stronger than a correlation. So why do we care about these relations between variables? And what does that have to do with the price of Diet Dr. Pepper at Walmart? Exploring whether a correlation exists between two variables, if there is a correlation, may guide further research into investigating whether one action causes the other. By understanding correlation and causality, it allows for policies and programs that aim to bring about a desired outcome to be better targeted, funded, and executed. Some relations are spurious on the surface. And spurious is just a fancy word meaning false or fake or illegitimate. Nonsense, really, not to put too fine a point on it. This is where your logical reasoning comes in when someone presents you with a correlation. I'd encourage you to check the website tylervegan.com, T-Y-L-E-R-V-I-G-E-N.com. A monster list of just nonsense correlations plucked from data that's out there in the world. Uh, the best nonsense or spurious correlation I can remember from my statistics classes years ago is the relation between wearing earrings and giving birth. That's a pretty high correlation. Even with a lot more men deciding that they were going to be wearing earrings in the recent past. But earrings don't cause someone to give birth and giving birth does not cause someone to wear earrings. That's an example of a spurious or nonsense relationship. So that's all well and good for earrings, but that's a very simple example. Correlations can be much more complex. And this is where we're going to head to stats.stackexchange.com, which I'm, where I'm going to shamelessly steal an example from that website. For instance, if we're looking at a much more complex correlation. Homeless population and crime rate might be correlated in that both tend to be high or low in the same locations. It is equally valid to say that homeless population is correlated with crime rate or crime rate is correlated with homeless population. To say that crime causes homelessness or homeless populations cause crime are two very different statements. And correlation does not imply that either is true. For instance, the underlying cause of both of those variables could be a third variable, such as drug abuse or unemployment. Let's get back to the article about diet pop. 
and how to read this article, given our newfound knowledge about correlation and causation, and the need to critically examine the information that you're presented with as a reader. The American Heart Association noted in its accompanying commentary on the article, uh, sorry, or on the study about diet pop and the health effects that may follow from drinking diet pop. The American Heart Association noted the participants were overwhelmingly white, and it is possible that ethnic preferences may influence how often people select sugary or artificially sweetened drinks. So there's another variable that we need to look at. It wasn't, it wasn't controlled for ethnic preferences. It was controlled for age, sex, and all these other things that went in, but it didn't mention anything about race. People did not drink sugary sodas as often as diet sodas. So they call it soda instead of pop, Americans, uh, which could be one reason the researchers did not see an association with regular soda, since the participants may have been health conscious and just not consuming them as frequently. So there's another reason why the results might be skewed. People just may not have been drinking regular pop. The main limitation on this study, according to the American Heart Association, is the important point that an observational study like this cannot prove that drinking artificially sweetened drinks is linked to strokes or dementia, but it does identify an intriguing trend that will need to be explored in other, in other studies. So the study itself doesn't prove anything, and the American Heart Association agrees with the researchers saying that the study is merely observational. There is nothing that it is going to prove. There is no causal link there to be had, at least from this study. So what, what does that mean? If you're going through the steps of logically reasoning this out, does that mean you can go right back to full sugar drinks? Give me that root beer and that cherry vanilla Coke. There's no reason to ever drink diet pop ever again. Well, not so fast there. Let's slow down. People should most definitely not retreat to taking in many sugary drinks. Those sugary drinks, especially the high sugar pop that's out there, those drinks have been associated not only with obesity and other health consequences such as diabetes, but with poor memory and smaller overall brain volumes. So, sugar is no good. That's the, that's the gist that I'm getting here. Which is, which is fine. You could say it's just a spurious correlation from the diet pop study. No causation. I can have all the diet pop I want. But then we have to hold on again and look at other studies that came out which show that diet soda is associated with a whole bunch of things. Not just... Alzheimer's, dementia, and those other items that we mentioned before. And diet soda is associated with vascular disease, which might also have effects on the brain. So we've got sugar that makes your brain volume smaller and your memory poorer, but then we have diet pop, which also affects your brain in other ways. Other associations also exist between artificially sweetened drinks and weight gain, which is another topic unto itself. Uh, we did a uh, show on the main show, uh, Crew Round Table, where we were speaking about calorie counts on menus, and we got into quite the discussion on nutrition. I would encourage everyone to go and check that out as well. Uh, just head over to the website and you'll be able to find it. Uh, that, that weight gain uh, and the link between the weight gain and artificially sweetened drinks that might itself increase the risk for stroke and dementia, and other artificial sweeteners alter bacteria in the gut, which may have a negative effect on your overall health, leading to even further complications from existing conditions. And as Dr. Banner said in The Avengers, well, this all seems terrible. So we can't have sugar, we can't have diet pop, are we just relegated to drinking plain water for the rest of our lives, like Ned Flanders, with some, with some bread on the side for dipping? How do we get any reliable data from these studies? How can we change our behavior so that we're acting in the best interest of our own health? 
Once again, let's go back and look at the study itself on Diet Pop. The good news is that the actual number of people in the Diet Pop study reporting the behavior of drinking daily Diet Pop and suffering the effects that we listed earlier, such as dementia, is very small compared to the overall sample size. On a raw numbers basis, it's not much to worry about. Have as much diet pop as you like, as the odds of suffering ill effects, if they, ca if they causally exist, are very small in the general population anyway. At least that's what the data is showing. You would win the lottery before getting dementia from one diet drink consumed per day for the rest of your life. That's how the numbers work out. But, this is a big but, again, where your critical thinking comes in. But, given those numbers, this is another in a long line of correlations between diet pop and overall health issues that we went over earlier. As you observe correlations, they guide you in your future testing. The data showing we need to investigate because something is up with diet pop is certainly out there. There is a wealth of information, especially, and I was shocked to read the first time about uh, having diet pop being attributed to weight gain, because it makes no logical sense at first blush. But when you get into the study and read about what they were controlling for, you see that there's actually a very good case to be made that the diet pop does something to you, changes, your, changes the receptors in your body in such a way that you don't even notice that you are craving more food. You're craving more specific food to give you something that the diet pop is not giving you. And that means with all of this data, we need to investigate. Something is up with diet pop. The downside to all of this is that we cannot devise an experiment to prove any sort of causal link. I'll give you an example. We cannot feed healthy people copious amounts of either diet pop or sugary pop and see how sick they get. That would be the best way to prove results through controlled double-blind scientific testing, taking out all sorts of self-selection uh, bias, taking out all sorts of items that would cast doubt upon the results of the study, but, you know, morals, ethics, respect for human life, all that all that jazz gets in the way of progress sometimes. So has the point of this show just been an exercise for me to justify that I can drink my can of Diet Pop each day, that I can have my energy drink on the weekend if I feel like it? N no, it, it's to make you, the wonderful friends of Hot Takes with Gino, aware that when you hear correlation, not causation, the conversation is not over. That is a favorite phrase of people who wish to shut down conversation when they look at studies that give results that they do not personally like. When the results of studies go against what they believe, they will say it's correlation, not causation. Doesn't matter. Throw, this, throw the study out. I'm here to tell you the exact opposite. Correlation is the start of a real discussion to examine where we, as a society, go next with the data that's collected. Remember, correlations can guide you into where you should be looking after you apply your logic. We don't need any further studies to understand that the correlation between earrings and giving birth, or between wearing earrings and giving birth is a spurious or a nonsense relationship. But when you start talking about those social factors that we listed in that study of homelessness, violence, drug addiction. Those types of correlations tell you where you should keep looking, where you should target your observations. That's the start of a real discussion about where to go next as a society. You don't need to be a statistician to understand what the results of studies may indicate. You just need to think critically. It can be hard to drown out the noise, but you can do it. Don't just throw up your hands and say, me no like numbers, and then drag your knuckles and watch an afternoon of pro wrestling. Statistics is an art as much as a science, 
And every human being has the potential to create, to express themselves, and to learn critical thought. Now, my critical thought may be severely impaired from my consumption of diet pop, so while I'm still arguably cogent, I want to help everyone within the sound of my voice increase their critical capacity. Mind you, not everyone expresses critical thought to the same degree, but that's a topic for another show. And on that happy note, I want to say once again thank you for downloading Hot Takes with Gino. Please visit us on the web at crewroundtable.com and subscribe to our feed. You can find us in iTunes, you can find us in Google Play, you can find us on Stitcher Radio, you can find us wherever you download your podcasts. Until next time, take care of yourselves, everyone.